Scott hooked his lighted torch to his belt and lowered himself over the crumpled parapet of the well. Slowly he went down into the darkness, foot by foot, hand over hand, fending himself off the smooth sheer wall with his feet. The Geiger clicked steadily. At twenty feet, Scott paused to ease his muscles and listened. No sound came from below. He advised Alan that he was proceeding. At forty feet, he reported again. This time, he could hear running water, probably an underground river, but no increase in radiation levels. At sixty feet, Scott reported once more. Slight increase of radiation, well below danger level. Okay, Father. I'm going down another 20 feet. Stand by. Base from sky. 80 feet. About halfway to water level, I guess. I'll try the laser again. Damn! What's wrong, son? Nothing much, Dad. Dropped the laser. When I switched it on, I felt a sort of sharp tingling. Kind of startled me. What about the radiation, Scott? Uh, radiation? Scott! Scott! Are you all right? Scott, can you read me? Scott! Alan, what's happened? Are you still receiving Scott? No, Father. I can't make contact at all. He went off the air as though he'd switched off. Switched off? He wouldn't do a fool thing like that. Something's wrong. He was repeating my words just as though he didn't know what he was saying. Like a drugged man. Launch Thunderbird 2, Virgil. You go with him, Gordon. Take Thunderbird 4. Thunderbird 4, Dad? But even if there is water down there, I couldn't get to it. Do as I say, son. There is water. And you'd better be prepared for any eventuality. Get going. Yes, sir. Brains, go with Virgil and Gordon. They may need your know-how. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Tracy. Uh, I have been listening to Scott's transmissions. I share your feeling that uh, he may be in grave danger. Can I go with them, Dad? No, John. We can't strip international rescue of every operative. We don't know what we're up against. And if we should need Thunderbird 3, that's just you and me, son. And me, Mr. Tracy. Yes, Tintin. And you. But let's hope none of us will be needed. Good luck, boys. Thanks, Father. Don't worry. We'll bring him back. The picture rotated vertically, and Virgil swung out of sight and hurtled down the hidden chute beyond the wall. Seconds later, he shot through the roof of the vast hangar, hollowed out of the cliff, and into the open hatch above the cabin of the huge aircraft known as Thunderbird 2. It was standing on its stilts above the conveyor belt, which carried the six pods containing various rescue equipment. As Virgil landed in the pilot seat, he touched a switch. The conveyor belt moved to the left, and the huge craft settled down on its hydraulic stilts above the fourth pod, which was automatically locked into position in the main fuselage. He heard Gordon and Brains arrive in the cabin by the passenger elevator from the lounge and take their seats behind him and advise them to prepare for launch. The massive door of the hangar slid down to reveal the long palm-flanked runway leading down to the moonlit sea. Slowly, the great craft rolled forward on the wheels of the selected pod. Up in the lighted lounge, Jeff Tracy watched as Thunderbird 2 emerged from the cliff face beneath the house and the palms angled outwards to allow the giant wings free passage. The great craft stopped and a section of the runway tilted to form a skyward pointing ramp. The powerful turbines revved up to an ear-splitting whine. Jeff found himself instinctively holding his breath. Whenever any of his boys took off, he was in there with them in spirit, sharing their experience. With a blasting roar of exploding gases, Thunderbird 2 streaked up the ramp and hurtled into the night sky. 
As its rocket flare vanished, Jeff sighed and looked at John and Tintin. They had the same worried looks on their faces, and he knew they were thinking the same thing, hoping against hope that Thunderbird 2 arrived in time. <laughs> 